Good afternoon. Um, welcome back to the um, session, the second session. Um, just to welcome the uh, chairperson is uh, Kabir Saxena here. Thank you. And uh, before we start, we are just going to give a little token to all our speakers with the blessings of the Guru. So I'll just take this opportunity and then I'll hand over to uh, the chairman to continue the rest. So I'm not reintroducing or anything. Just kind of. Thank you so much. Uh, so ladies and gentlemen, we have an impossible task. We have to fit 90 minutes worth into 70 minutes. I've been told not to prejudice the tea break. Now, unless I get orders to the contrary, that will be what we do, although it seems a great shame if we have to uh, cease the flow of uh, authentic dissemination from great masters. So I hope we'll be allowed five, 10 minutes into the tea break. I don't know which organizer to look at for permission, <laughs> but I presume the silence uh, betrays uh, uh, consent. I think what we should do is that you are the chairman of the session. You oh. can take it through as long as you want. So let's avoid the tea break. <laughs> <laughs> Joking. No, no, I'm the one who will suffer the most. So thank you. Um, they say karma is definite. And um, so I don't know what karma brought me on this stage with uh, such great practitioners. Of course, a little help from high places also helps. Um, but this is said to be some karmic cause. I don't know what the collective karmic cause would be for us to have this amazing opportunity to not only talk about such a great figure as Guru Rinpoche, but in the presence of you know, the unimaginable people who are actually beings who are actually carrying on the lineage, the parampara of Guru Rinpoche, parampara being defined by Samdang Rinpoche as a tradition from a divine or holy source, from an Arya source, and which is still coming down in an unbroken lineage from the time of its first disseminator, and which does not contradict logic and reasoning. So, of course, some aspects of Guru Rinpoche's life do defy logic and reasoning, like flying in the sky and so forth. But maybe there are other levels of logic which uh, ordinary people like me don't understand. So anyway, we've created the marvelous collective karma to be here together and to <coughs> listen to um, these great masters, one master I've heard before. I'm very happy to see in person uh, Nathan Chagli Rinpoche, whom I've heard about. Uh, but never met, so um, really it's a great honor for me, who is a miserable wretch of the degenerate era, to be quite frank. So to be allowed this opportunity to um, introduce such uh, great uh, speakers, um, thank you so much. <clears throat> so we'll start now with uh, Nathan Chokling Rinpoche, and if you want to read about Rinpoche, it's on page 18. I don't think I want to take any time for that, except that just to read about Rinpoche is something extraordinary and uh, mind-boggling. But here we have, uh, in human form, a person who is going to share about uh, Padmasambhava, sage of the Himalayas. So uh, I would request, uh, most humbly request Rinpoche to, um, to guide us and to inspire us and enlighten us um, with, your, with your presentation. So Rinpoche, we'll, we'll see how the time goes, but I'll try not to interrupt at any point um, until I see Amitabh Mathurji nodding off or something, then I will know that it's tea time. <coughs> so thank you so much. Namaste and respect to everyone. 
Um, today is very special that we are gathered here and <clears throat> talking in conference about the life of Pemasambawa. Life of Pemasambawa was actually very uh, vast and very big. Uh, it's really difficult to talk in a very short period of time. Mm. But still, that we had to uh, talk a few things about Guru uh, And I, what I, my limited mind, and thought that what is important, few things from Guru Bhaji's life, and I will try to uh, talk. And actually, I wrote it few um, things here so that I won't say unnecessary things uh, in such, such a short period of time. So we, I don't want to waste any of time. Um, so uh, I will start by the, reciting the, uh, one of the well-known prayer to the uh, Masambawa. It's um, the great Indian pundit who is uh, kindness for Tibet's great, the one born from lotus whose body is beyond birth and death. Right now, Trimming the subduing in the Russia of the <clears throat> southwest, the, the precious one of the Udiana, to you we pray. So actually, this prayer says, whole life of Pemasambhava, uh, in a very short form. Uh, but actually, there is uh, many different uh, life stories about the Guru Rinpoche. Uh, we say it's over a thousand uh, life stories of the Guru Rinpoche and mm, Some of uh, the stories actually told by himself, and some of the stories actually written by his followers. So uh, anyway, uh, uh, life stories like Pema Sambawa, uh, is mainly we have to understand and the two different ways. Uh, one is the uh, our ordinary way of telling without our uh, within our capacity of understanding with our normal limit limited human mind. The other way the other way is to go beyond our intellect, which is limited to our mind. We have to understand with the open mind. Before he came to Tibet, he was already living in India for many hundreds of years. According to the Nirvana Sutra, the Buddha prophesies about the Pemasambhavas, appears uh, 12 years after his passing away. This means that Pemasambhava was already thousand years in thousand years in India before he comes to bed. Those things are beyond our normal intellect, so we have to understand his life within with open mind. Actually, it is not just about Pemasambhava, but to understand any spirituality, we have to go beyond our limited mind. Uh, in the 8th century, Tisung uh, Dezin is the rule Tibet. He becomes the king at the young age of 15. Ever since he became the ruler, Tisung Dezin had been fighting wars with the neighboring tribes and countries. He had been continuously fighting 
battles for seven years. When he was, when he was 17 years old, he came across the Buddhist uh, scripture, the sutra. Um, these two sutras had come into the, his uh, hand of his ancestors, the King La Totori. Through his past karma, and Tissu Dezin started to have interest in uh, Buddha Dharma. He sent his envoy to India to invite the Shintarakshita, who was the abbot of Nalanda University. The Nalanda abbot uh, came to Tibet and he taught mainly the sutras. They had Buddhist temple during the Sunzun Gambus time around the seventh century, but the Dharma had no rooted in Tibet. Tisum Dezi realized that for the Dharma of flourish in land, there must be a, a Sangha, a community of practitioners. With this thought in mind, Tisum Dezi wanted to make a Tibet's first Buddhist monastery. He wants this monastery to be a place where the three jewels, the Buddha, the Dharma, the Sangha, are made the objects of devotion for this purpose. He started building a Sami monastery, but the local spirits were not supportive of the king's wishes. They tried their best to make sure the, the monastery was not built. Whatever the men built in the daytime, the spirits will destroy in the nighttime. The spirits created diseases and imbalance in the weather and the brought suffering to the people who then started blaming the Dharma for their suffering. This led to the people not wanting to involve anymore in the activities connected to the Dharma. The king felt helpless and hopeless. But Shinta Rakshita told the king that he should not worry about because of there is a solution. Just hearing that, the king was already very happy. And then the king asked, what can we do? And Shinta Rakshita said, there is pundit called Pema Sambhava he is born miraculously from the lotus. He is right now in Buddha Gaya, and you must invite him. Um, as I said before, Guru Rinpoche has uh, many different versions of the life story. And uh, there is some of the story he was born into just miraculously just appear in this world. And sometimes he is the one of the son of the king. Uh, and there's many few different versions, but like I said before, we have to understand the in Latin being, say life in legacy is beyond our normal intellect mind. So uh, for general, for the, all the Himalayan people, so, so Pema Sambhava is known as a, a born in a lotus. It is said that Pema Sambhava appeared in the different parts of India in the same time, but having a different names. All these different manifestations were crying, crying out different activities in different places. One day he came to Buddha Gaya to offer praises to the Buddha. While there, he miraculously manifest many wonderful offering to the Buddha's Vajra seat, where the Buddha had a seat and become enlightened. Someone sees Pema Sambhava and asks him, who is your teacher? In India, student has to have a lineage uh, which trace his teacher and the teacher's teacher. Pema Sambhava tells this man that he has no teacher. 
The man is shocked. He tells the Pemasambhava that without uh, authentic teacher and authentic lineage, you must be a demon. Then Pemasambhava then realized that in order to convince and help sentient beings, it was very important to come down to the ordinary level and it was important to have a teacher in the lineage. He then goes to different parts of India to study with the different teachers and he had many teachers, both male and female. But the eight Vidya Dara of the India are the, his main teachers. He even studied medicine, art, and um, carpentries. Basically, he studied uh, uh, many different things. This, the seven invoice sent by Tibetan king, Tisung Dezen, and Pemasambhava meet in Bodhgaya. On the meeting, the seven Tibetan Pemasambhava knew that it was very important for him to go to Tibet. He accepted the invitation to go. While the Muslim Baba was in Nepal on the way to Tibet, the spirits of Tibet and Nepal were already getting nervous and irritated <coughs> on hearing that the Muslim Baba was coming to Tibet. The spirits carried many obstacles for the Muslim Baba on his way to Tibet. Pemasambhava subdued many spirits along the way. He not only subdued them, but also taught them the teachings of the Buddha and made them a protector of the Dharma and the guidance of the Dharma practitioners. When they first met, the Tibetan king thought that Pemasambhava would pay him homage by prostituting to him. Pemasambhava does not mind prostituting to anyone, but in order to tame, uh, tame the Tibetan king's ego, in order to set up an auspicious beginning and to show the king the value and importance of the Dharma, he purposely does not prostitute to the king. In order to tame the king's arrogance, he shows him that subjugating mudra with his finger. It burns the clothes of the Tibetan's king. The king and his retinue, seeing the powers of the Pemasambhava, prostrate to him. The auspicious condition had been set up for the Dharma. Pandit uh, Shinda Rakshita and Pemasambhava and the Dharma King Tisum Detsin. We call them Kenop Chisum. The coming together of these three people, especially the Pemasambhava, brought a revolution in Tibet. Some intellects <coughs> jokingly say that decline of the Tibet started after the arrival of the Pemasambhava in Tibet. These people are right from their own point of view uh, because Tibet was a big empire when Pemasambhava first arrived. Slowly the Tibetans become less and less interested in the worldly matters, especially fighting battles to expand their territories. Basically, anything to do with the harming the Sunjin beings and the Tibetans had no interest. The entire land adopted the Buddha's teaching. Pema Sambhava brought the teachings of the Buddha and taught starting from the king to the everyone. It was a common sight to see people flying in the sky going through the walls, leaving footprints, handprints, and body prints um, on the rocks and cliffs, and becoming rainbow bodies. 
Therefore, the entire land was uh, filled with the special beings. Those were the first Mahasiddhas. Until now, there is continuous streams of the Mahasiddhas. All over the Himalaya, you will see the signs of the Mahasiddhas who had followed the footsteps of the Pemasambhava. Even today, there are some hidden Mahasiddhas and some not hidden Mahasiddhas. I myself am fortunate to meet some Mahasiddhas in the 21st century and witness their compassion and qualities of the Bodhisattva. We have also witnessed some miracles from those masters. Pema Sambhava established all of the Buddha's teaching, the Sutra and the Tantra. He categorized the entire teaching of the Buddha into a nine yanas. Pemasambhava invited more than 100 pundits from India, including the Vimala Metta. Pemasambhava also trained many Tibetan lots of us, the translator, teaching them Sanskrit so that their lots of us could communicate with the Indian pundits. The Indian pundits and the Tibetan lots of us translate not only the teachings of the Buddha, but also the commentaries by Indian pundits and Mahasiddhas on the Buddhist teaching. Swami Monastery was a successfully complete. It become, became the treasure house for the precious teaching of the Buddha. Within the complex of Swami Monastery, there were different temples in structures. Some areas were used for the translation some were used for the meditation, some were used for the expanding the Dharma in some parts where the monks are used and there were place also for the lay male and female practitioners. There were the laboratories, uh, uh, the printing, where Buddhist texts were translated and copied and stored. When the Bengali Pandit, Atisha, who, who was the abbot of the Vikramashila University, came to Tibet in the 11th century, he was amazed at the core collection of the Buddhist texts at the Sami Monastery. He thought that he had seen and study all the Buddhist texts that ever exist, but there were some texts at Sami Monastery that was seen for the first time. The Buddha Dharma was like the sunrise in Tibet. All the teachings of the Pemasambhava and the Mahapandits are passed down from the teacher to student and unbroken lineage up until now. We can trace back any teachings that we have received, start straight up to Pemasambhava, all the way to his own teacher. We don't accept any teachings or practice without any authentic lineage. During the time of the Pemasambhava in Tibet, it was the perfect time to bring the Dharma from India because of very soon, around the 12th century, the Nalanda University will be destroyed and the Buddha Dharma in the decline states. It is thanks to Pemasambhava that the entire Himalayan region was open to the teachings of the Buddha, especially the Vajrayana. Pemasambhava's specialty is the Therma or treasure tradition. The treasure tradition is very effective and an intelligent way of preserving and propagating the teachings and bringing benefit at the right time. As we all know, time and situations are changing all the time. This is the nature of samsara 
there have been great changes from the time of the Buddha up until now. Many new things have come and many old things have been disappeared. Parmasambhava designed the Therma system so that the teachings can be revealed and come out in the right time. In the Himalayas, since the time of the Parmasambhava up until now, there have been many changes, but because of the Therma system, the teachings survive and stay authentic. Parmasambhava's treasure are not just the teachings, he also uh, hide the uh, goals and wealth and time of needed, and also, uh, like Tasha Kamaura mentioned in the earlier, the, about the hidden lands called Bayul. The hidden lands where the people can find the refuge from the uh, war and the environmental disasters. Also, there are many prophecies by the Pemasambhava regarding the future. He set up and designed everything for the future sentient beings, but they, at the same time, how much it will be work depends on uh, how much we will be able to follow his instructions. It is like in the instructions from the good doctor. It is important to follow the doctor's full instruction to get the good result. The Buddha said, I will show you the path to liberation but liberation depend on it, upon you. Since Pemasambhava came to Tibet, until now, some period in the time we follow his instructions well, and some period we could not follow well, he, well his instructions. Most of us are clearly aware of the results of the not following his instructions, and well, we also know we, very clearly the benefits of the following his instructions. Many of us around the world who know and follow in the footsteps of the Pemasambhava, he is father figure and the guide. He is someone you can rely on 100%. He is someone who is always there for you. Those things are not streaming from the blind faith. This faith and confidence in the Pemasambhava comes from the experience of the following his instructions. Pemasambhava himself said, for those who have faith in me, I sleep in the, your doorsteps. This is his promise. Pemasambhava is not just the spiritual guide, he is also someone who is there for you in our mundane worldly life. There is a prayer by him called dispelling the obstacles. This prayer dispels all sorts of obstacles in our life. For example, one line in the prayer is asking Pemasambhava to help with the travelers to save journey. Even for such a small matters, such as the traveling, there is prayer to him. Similarly, for every problem, he is there for you. This is why he composed this prayer. This is just one example. There are many other prayers in practice by Pemasambhava. Basically, he will be there for you, starting from the small obstacles to the something very big. After finish, Shing the, all the, his activities in Tibet, and he wants to go to uh, Chamara, the land of the Rakshas. The Tibetan request Pemasambhava to stay back and guide them. But he told them that he had done everything for them, and now it was a time, to, time for him to go to Chamara to subdue the king who was uh, going to harm sentient beings, especially the people of our world. Pemasambhava said, before they become out of control and bringing suffering to the, our world, I have to go and subdue them. 
As of now, he is still in Chamara, subduing the Tamin, the Rakshas. When he was leaving Tibet, he consoled the Tibetans by saying that there is no need to feel sad. Even though I am not physically in this world, I am always there for you because I am beyond birth and death. If you want to follow me, then practice the Dharma. Almost everyone in Tibet becomes the serious practitioners. Taking an example of the single monastery like the Kathok, within the single monastery, there are more than 100,000 practitioners who achieve the rainbow body. This took place many years after the Pemasambhava had left Tibet. Also in Tharpaling in Bhutan, under the guidance of the great masters, Longchenpa, there have been many practitioners who attend the Rambo bodies. So this is just the true example of the uh, monasteries, but there is thousands of monasteries, and not only that, there is uh, uh, hidden uh, practitioners that who achieve the enlightened without anyone uh, notice. Becoming a rainbow body is one sign of the spiritual accomplishment. The body dissolved into a dharma dhatu. The body dissolved into the true nature. The land was full of enlightened beings. It is like the story when Pema Sambhava went to the land of Ugen in India. He taught the people there, starting from the king of Urjan to the lower subject, they become his student. The entire land became empty because everyone was enlightened and had achieved their rainbow body. Pema Sambhava went to many different places to help beings. We are aware of some of lands that he visited, and there are also places that we don't know of. What we know for sure is they visited all over the Himalaya regions. It is very clear that he's visited those places because their culture and their festival and their holy places of those areas are all connected to the Pemasambhava. From the culture to the spirituality aspects, Pemasambhava is associated with all. Today, around the world, there are millions who follow in the Pemasambhava's footsteps. He benefits us in many different ways, both in worldly and spiritual ways. We will never forget the kindness of the Indian Mahapandit called Pemasambhava. It is very auspicious that we are all gathered here today talking on the life and the legacy of the Pema Sambhava in this own land. And I'd like to say thank you to the, all the organizers for this event, uh, because it's a, um, earlier uh, this, we say that uh, even the Pema Sambhava is very well known in Himalaya regions. Uh, all our cultures and spirituality, everything is uh, connected with the Guru Pema Sambhava. So even though it is very well known in the Himalaya regions, but that in, uh, now in all over the world, the Pema Sambhava is very uh, well known. Uh, but in, in India, and in his own place is uh, very um, uh, limited uh, uh, to his life stories. Um, so I think uh, that Pema Sambhava is uh, uh, such an important uh, for 
especially for the future uh, sentient beings and future uh, people. So, uh, so I think it's very auspicious that we are getting here today and we're talking about this. And thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Nathan Chakri Rinpocheji, uh, especially for reminding us of our limited mind and that much of this is beyond intellect, but it's that uh, Padma Sambhava and his kindness also decided to show that he had a lineage, and also reminding us of the collective karma of beings in his time when they could see marvelous signs like flying yogis and footprints Nowadays, of course, we have different flying machines and have to be careful of our carbon footprints. Um, but we're in a different time, and Rinpoche has reminded us that if we actually practice the teachings of Guru Rinpoche, then maybe we can change uh, the karma of ourselves, karma of our planet. So thank you very, very much, uh, Rinpoche Ji. And now, um, Yonge Mingyu Rinpoche is going to speak on the life and teachings of uh, Guru Padma Sambhava. Uh, Rinpoche is, I think, very well known now um, uh, for his teachings, for his books, which I myself have also partially read and found very useful, especially since they contain actual um, dialogues and um, uh, accounts of uh, Rinpoche's meetings and teachings, uh, help given to actual students around the world, people with problems like you and me. So Anne Rinpoche is very clearly in his book shown how uh, the Buddha Dharma can um, help such beings, especially since Rinpoche himself said that he went through much difficulty as a young man uh, with, with panic, panic attacks and so forth, and how he coped with that. Um, <clears throat> also, I think uh, Rinpoche's example of uh, leaving his monastery and wandering for three years or so, just, just, just leaving, getting up and going, was an inspiration to many people after the initial shock. Um, and I think it seems like uh, Rinpoche's guru, uh, His Eminence uh, Taishitu Rinpoche Ji, was, was happy that uh, Rinpoche did that, that he was leaving the monastic, re uh, not the monastic, but the uh, bureaucratic uh, regime of a monastery, which requires a lot of, um, you know, certain kind of uh, looking after, and just wandered and... Uh, met with so many people and faced hardships, just like the yogis of old. So anyway, without further ado, Rinpoche, please uh, guide us and inspire us with your uh, talk on life and teachings of Guru Padma Sambhava. <coughs> Thank you very much for Geshe Kabir. <laughs> just not Exaggeration of my story. <laughs> um, for all the uh, venerables, um, brothers, sisters. Oh, yeah. Hello? The I think it's, we don't want to curtail it, Rinpoche, so at least, <clears throat> at least take, take as much time as it takes to what you really want 15, to say. 15, 20 minutes? Yes, 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 yes. Okay. So, <coughs> the live and teachings about the Guru Masambhava, so that's two topics. So, during because of the limitation of time. Should I focus more about the life or teaching? Teaching. Teaching, raise your hand. Life? Ah, teaching, okay. <laughs> so, as we all know about the, in this morning and now, Nidin Chonli Rinpoche discuss about Guru Rinpoche's uh, life story. So, the practice, the practice of the main, main teaching of Guru Pema Sambhava is to connect with the, our fundamental nature, the pure awareness, Rigpa, primordial wisdom. So, this pure awareness, primordial wisdom is deathless. Why is it unborn? So there's no beginning, so no, you're not going to die. But of course, for us, we're getting old, sick, die, isn't it? But uh, 
the Guru Rinpoche said, these are illusion. Just like in your dream, you can become sick, old, and die. But this is all an illusion. So how you can free that? The most important thing is the wisdom. For example, if you have a nightmare, anybody who had have, having nightmare sometime? Raise your hand. Me too, sometime. <laughs> So we all have nightmare. So let's say you go to the Himalayas. You know, Himalayas is not, uh, you know, what we think is so nice. Wow, a lot of, if you, when you were there, very nice. But the journey to the Himalayas, mm, not so nice. <laughs> the trails, you know, the road are very tiny. And there's a lot of wild animals, landslide. Suppose that you go to him. You want to go to Himalaya, and you went to Himalaya, and one day you have wonderful dream in the Himalaya that you are having samosa. <laughs> you know, there's no samosa in the Himalayas. <laughs> Where I've been to in the Himalayas, not easy to find samosa. This morning we have nice samosa, so you're missing samosa, missing samosa, and finally you get samosa in the Himalaya mountain. Someone offer you a nice samosa, and you really want to have samosa, you know. So this is a very, very special. So I want to offer this Guru Bema Sambhava, this samosa, you know. There's some practice, chok practice, Om Ahong, you know. Guru, Om Ambeza Guru Bema Siddhi Hong Sabbarawa, the Karna Zara Punza Kai. And you offer samosa and with the closed eyes. But suddenly, in the Himalayas, there's a big bird. And one big bird come while you close your eyes, offering this samosa to Guru Pemba Sambhava. Big, big bird took your samosa? Gone. So now you might cry in your dream. Right? So not only that, there's a wild bears, tigers, leopards in the uh, Himalayas, landslide. So a lot of problem. So when you're having this dream in the Himalayas, so what is the best solution? To free from the, this dream without wake up. Any answer? Without wake up. To know that it's a dream. To know that is a dream. Yeah, that's the best solution. To know that you're dreaming, then the wild animal cannot eat you. And uh, you know that samosa is a dream. When the bird took your samosa, OK. As, and also you know it's a dream. You can make another samosa. Right? So you don't need to follow the rules of the dream when you recognize this. So similarly, the, what Guru Pema Sambhava, the main teaching is all these are like dream. So being born, getting old, sick, died is a dream. But if you totally recognize this, then you will achieve, as Cholin Rinpoche mentioned, rainbow body or death's body. So there's a lot of legends that Guru Bhema Sambhara lived thousands of years, right? So there's a lot of stories. Even like Dharmas, there's a lot of, uh, the Guru Bhema Sambhara himself mentioned that I was born from Dhanakosha Lake by from the born by lotus flower, or I suddenly manifest on the um, Shiripata in Sri Lanka, sudden manifestation, or I was the son of the king, might be Orissa, somewhere. There's, he was being born as a normal family. So all these are a lot of uh, mysteries. So for the dream, it doesn't matter, <laughs> right? But uh, if you really want to, uh, by scientifically, if you really want to locate it, where Guru Pema Samba was born, I think this will be the big discussion, I think. So we have to continue to discuss about that. <coughs> OK, so now, the main teaching about the Guru Pema Sambhava is to recognize who we are and how about our life in this world. 
So the main thing is about the wisdom. So there are, as Cholun Rinpoche mentioned, the Guru Pema Sambhava categorized all the Buddha Dharma as nine yanas. The Shavaka, Patrika Buddha, Buddha Sattva, and then Tiya Uba Yoga, and then also Maha, Anu, Ati, so total nine. And these nine yana is include entire Buddha Dharma. So Buddha taught 84,000 different teachings, what we call. Everything include in these nine yanas. And, um, and also Guru Pema Sambhava has eight different manifestations, right? So all these eight different manifestations is kind of a life story about how Guru Pema Sambhava learned these nine yanas, like begin by Guru Shakta Singha, which is he learned from the, um, the basic yana. Um, Shavaka, Bhartika Buddha, and Bodhisattva, Trayam, all this, and all these manifestations. But main focus is about three yogas. Maha Yoga, Anu Yoga, Adi Yoga, Adi Yoga. So Maha Yoga is based on the developmental stage. With the, we have this imagination power. We all have. Do you have imagination? Yeah. Right? Without imagination, you cannot come here. Right? And without imagination, you cannot go back. The imagination has image in our mind. There's a words, image, and there's some sensation, and there's memory. All this work together. So this imagination has great power that we can transform our life, even our body, even our perception. Of course, we can transform our emotion, thought, everything through this imagination power of imagination. Do you want to try? <laughs> How many of you know strawberry? Of course, you all know strawberry, right? How many of you like strawberry? Raise your hand. Orange, how many of you like orange? Okay, orange more or strawberry more? Orange, mm. strawberry, more orange, I think. Okay, now hold your hand like this. Close your eyes. And imagine that the best orange is in your hand. Fresh, nice smell. And with the leaves. Okay? So now bring close to your mouth as if you're going to eat orange. Mmm. Okay. Now open your eyes. How is your mouth? <laughs> Full of saliva? <laughs> yeah? So automatically, it will produce saliva in our mouth. Actually, there's no orange in your hand. Orange does not exist. But the power of imagination, when your mind imagining there's orange, a change in your body. So it produced the saliva. So similarly, the Maha Yoga, the main focus is about the developmental stage, the, the visualization. So there are a lot of texts, sadhana, more than three or four thousand different sadhanas. And a lot of them, while Guru Pema Sambhava in Tibet, he taught these teachings. And the most of them, I would say 90% of them, he put into the uh, rocks, lake, disciples' mind. Uh, so what we call treasure. So the treasure, there's a um, treasure from the earth, from the water, from the mind, from the vision, from the sky. So, so many different treasures. So still now, these are living lineage. Still, we can 
have, we can see new Tetun, Tetun means treasure revealer, and they ho all have this sadhana, the practice. And most of them are the, uh, composed by Guru Pema Sambhava. And all this, the, the unique thing is, all these different sadhana, many thousands of sadhana, the, the wording, the meaning, the poem is same. Just like one person wrote all this. It is not the, our normal develop, uh, like we can study about how to write poem. In Tibet, we have big volume of text, but it doesn't fit into that category, that rule. The Guru Mbuches, that sadhana, all the text is very experiential. Go directly to your heart. It's based on the meditation, the wisdom. So it is simple, meaning is very important, vast, and go direct to the heart. So, so all these, many of them are the practice of Guru Pema Sambhava himself. So there's not so many, uh, the, the Masidas or scholars, they wrote about them, the practice of themselves. But the Guru Mahasya, most of them are there. So then the main practice, development of main practice is imagining the quality, the wisdom, the compassion, the awareness, clarity of the enlightened being mixed with imagination skill, imaginative, imaginative way right now with your body. So that's the image of Guru Pema Sambhava here. So when we imagine, we need to imagine like moon reflection appear in the lake. Not solid, not real. So that is what we call vipassana. It's emptiness. So you will have direct experience of emptiness. But then you have to aware this awareness, shamatha practice. And why you want to practice this? To want to benefit for all beings. So that's the bodhicitta. And also, the quality of enlightened, like vast, the beyond conceptual wisdom, primordial wisdom, the pure awareness, boundless love, love and compassion. You can imagine those, right? For the imagination world, you can do anything. You cannot experience right now, but for the imagination world, you can experience. So all this combined together, you are imagining right now, I am Padma Sambhava. Can you do that? Do you want to try? Maybe we can try. So please keep your spine loosely straight. And close your eyes. And you all have this enlightened quality, what we call Buddha nature, the Skada Garva. And that Skada Garva, there's no difference between you and Padma Sambhava and all the enlightened beings. That is your, your true nature, who you are. So actually, you are Padma Sambhava. So now, please. Imagine or feel that you are Padma Sambhava. I am enlightened being. My body manifests as Guru Mbuch's body, like moon reflection in the lake. And don't worry about clear picture. The form and color is not so important. The most important is the sense of the enlightened quality with you right now. Now I have this boundless of wisdom and I'm feeling boundless of love and compassion. I'm the embodiment of all the enlightened being. What we call Bajra pride. 
Okay, now you can open your eyes. How was it? Who are you? <laughs> are you Bema Samba? <laughs> For the imagination world, yes. But don't tell this outside, you know, when you go out. Uh, nice to meet you. I'm Bema Samba. You know. <laughs> For the relative, we are not yet. For the, for the absolute level, yes. So that is the developmental stage, the essence of the Maha Yoga. And second is Anu Yoga. Anu Yoga is connected with the, the body, the prana, bindu, nadi, working with the body. And that is there in the Guru Mbuch's teachings, but he didn't emphasize too much about the Anu Yoga. It's there, but it's quite risky sometimes. If people don't know how to practice well, you might become crazy. And the, now the most important part is the Adi Yoga. The Adi Yoga is direct connect to the primordial wisdom, the pure awareness, which is we all have the mind, right? Do you have mind? How many of your mind? Raise your hand. <laughs> I want you to do more exercise with your hand, you know, arm. So. Who have mind? Mm. And how many of you don't have mind? <laughs> so, you all, you both right. <laughs> Those who said I have mind, of course you have mind. Right? Those who said I don't have mind, of course you don't have mind. <laughs> so actually our mind is combination of these two. The real nature of mind. Is there, exist? You can hear, you can smell, you can test, and there's thought comes, emotion comes, everything comes and goes, but the nature itself, untangible. It's empty. We cannot really define it. We cannot really grab it. It is unborn. There's no beginning. But thought has a beginning, emotion has a beginning, perception has a beginning, and these are changing, changing, changing. So what we call the mind is like sky. Sky is always pure, present, unborn. So sky cannot die. But at the same time, sky is allowing cloud, right? Pollution also. Um, dupan, dupan, right? Taibung, Korokin. So everything is here in the sky. Pollution cannot change sky. The storm cannot change sky. Sky is always present and pure. So our fundamental nature of mind, just like that. And this is always present. We are talking within this primordial mind, thinking within that state. Seeing within that state, eating samosa within that state. But we don't know. So we don't see that. That's the, what we call ignorant. It's there with you, but you don't see it. So therefore, the best teaching for the ma'ati is recognition, to recognize your own true nature. So then, that is the liberates, knowing one liberates all. So that's the essence of the Adi Yoga teaching, Guru Mbachi's teaching. So when I was young, I was born in Nepal in the Himalaya mountain. So the first, one of the first, my mantra for me is Om Ahong Bajara Guru Padmasiti Hong. So the first mantra is Guru Mbachi mantra. In my village, everybody practiced that. And I am having panic when I was young, not happy. So I try to pretend to meditate, but I have no idea about meditation. So what I do is I choose some mantras. So one of them is Om Aum Bhaja Guru Bhamasidu. Recite in the mind. And in my hometown, there's a lot of uh, treasure revealed in the past. So there's some cave, nearby cave, there's empty hole which is treasure, which is revealed by one of the dead ones in the past. And there's a treasure sign also, we can see in my, there's a sign of Bajra cross. So, and in my life, I also met great dead one, Dingu Chinsurumbachi, Let Dingu Chinsurumbachi, which is revealed the treasure from the mine, from the earth, from the um, lake, 
which is the living uh, Tibetan that I met. And also in Tibet, we have great um, what we legends of um, emanation of Guru Pema Sambhava. So one of the, my teacher, Tai Sidurumbuchi, is the fourth Patma Tang, Tang meaning speech of the Guru Rinpoche. So total there are six of them. Now my teacher Tai Sidurumbuchi is four. So two more will come in the future. So this prophecy, this uh, um, are the alive. So living tradition still now. So I think I hope this uh, through this conference uh, you all get some connection with the life and teachings of Guru Pema Sambhava and to benefit for you and all of you. And thank you very much for all the organizers. <coughs> uh, this is a really uh, happy to be participate. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rinpoche, for that, um, helping us to uh, engage in a few exercises that uh, make it come to life in your own uh, inimitable style. Thank you very much, indeed. Uh, and now we'll move on to Grampa Se Namka Dorjeji. Uh, Venerable, what does your name mean? What does Hungrampa mean? This is it a family name? Family name. Okay, okay. Maybe I should have read properly this. Uh... So Hungrampa Dojeji, yeah, whom I might have seen in Nepal, but I forgot, chief spiritual advisor of Bodhanath Stupa. So, um, and educated at the Zongsa Shedra of dialectics in Bir, uh, probably at what is now Deer Park. The small, uh, what is now Deer Park Institute, um, and has traveled extensively in India and Nepal, founder of the Gagar Hongkram Foundation, and a school in Dolpo, uh, offering free education to children from nearby villages, undertaken projects for healthcare, environmental protection, and sustainable community development for pastoral communities in that region. So. Uh, Rinpocheji, we don't have a title for your talk, so you'll mm. have to oh, tell yes. us the mm. title. Uh, the Legacy of Guru Rinpoche in Bhutan. Okay, The Legacy of Guru Rinpoche <coughs> in Bhutan. So, Venerable, please enlighten us and inspire us with your talk. My devoted respect to our eminence, Rinpoche's, and then Venerable, uh, Geshe's Kempos and respected all the scholars, brothers and sisters, I would like to extend my Tashidilik greetings to all of you. <clears throat> so uh, my topic of the presentation is uh, the contribution or the legacy of Guru Padma Sambhava related to Bhutan. Why I chose this topic is because my respect, my love, my feeling for this wonderful country, Bhutan. I've been hearing from many uh, different scholars about the life legacy of Guru Padma Sampawa in different occasions from different scholars and figures. But what I uh, notice is that the great deal of, you know, activities related to Bhutan of Guru Padma Sampawa is not much discussed and talked or heard about. So I thought it is really important to talk about. Initially, I didn't know there are so many, there will be so many participants from Bhutan, you know, all the scholars and great teachers and masters. But anyway, this is my love for the country. And it is my um, wish that I wanted to. So accordingly, I uh, prepared it. And then I'm here from, uh, from Nepal, representing Semo Saraswati, the daughter of Kyabji Chajarambuchi. So without any further 
delay, I would like to go with my presentation. So I begin with the PowerPoint, the beautiful Padmasambhava uh, photo that I have. I would like to uh, show to all of you, and then I begin with this. Let me begin with a uh, little bit about the country, Bhutan. As you know, the Kingdom of Bhutan is located in the eastern Himalayas, bordered by the Tibetan Autonomous Region in the north, the Sikkim state of India, and the Chumbi Valley of Tibet in the west, the Arunachal Pradesh state of India in the east, and the states of Assam and West Bengal in the south. Bhutan geopolitically belongs to South Asia and is the region's second least populations, uh, populous nation with its uh, 800,000, roughly about 800,000 inhabitants. Bhutan was always an independent country. It has never been colonized in its history. The Bhutanese state developed a district a uh, distinct uh, national identity based on Buddhism. Bhutan was for a long time in isolation and its name became known worldwide well, only after the fourth king of Bhutan, King Jigme Singhwanchu, coined the term gross national happiness in 1972 and declared that gross national happiness is more important than gross domestic product. The concept impl uh, implies that the sustainable development should take a ho holistic approach towards nation of progress and give equal importance to non-economic aspect of well-being. Is it okay? Um, sorry. Mm -hmm. Forward for slide. Okay, I'm, I'm using this arrow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is uh, the next photo. I, I, I forgot it. <laughs> anyway, <clears throat> um, the concept implies that the sustainable development should take a holistic approach towards new uh, notions of uh, progress and give equal importance to non-economic aspects of well-being. The idea of gross national happiness, GNH, also captured the imagination of others far beyond Bhutan's borders. In 2011, the UN unanimously adopted a General Assembly resolution introduced by Bhutan with support from 68 member states calling for a holistic approach to development aimed at promoting sustainable happiness and well-being. Let me begin my actual presentation with these curious questions. How is it possible that a small country like Bhutan has never been colonized? How can B, that it became the last standing Vajrayana Buddhist kingdom. And it's regarded to be the happiest country in Asia and eighth happiest country in the world. So I would like to begin with these questions. The photo is of eight manifestations of Guru Rinpoche. If we look at, okay, so uh, in my presentation, I would like to also um, stress a little bit about, you know, some of those um, criticisms, not only talk about, you know, um, those miraculous activities and amazing, um, legendary sort of, you know, uh, things that Guru Padmasambhava did, but also we should talk, this is very important, I think, that those elements opposing Guru Rinpoche, who went against Guru Rinpoche, you know, it's uh, kind of, so, uh, what do you call it, um, evil written for good done. <laughs> this has also happened and nobody talks about it. I'm not to inst I mean, um, involved in any sort of uh, controversy or create a, some kind of, you know, any kind of uh, sectarian issues or whatever, but I really feel these issues are important, really important to be talked and discussed. So I'll be also stressing, uh, stressing a little bit about these uh, aspect in my presentation. If we look at the early Tibetan sources, we find that the uh, spirits of Bhutan were subjugated by the Doji Tole from uh, Doji Tole form of Padmasambhava in Parutaksan, the tiger nest. 
cave. This event was described in the Katan literature and numerous other sources. Bhutan, a land blessed by Padmasambhava, is the perfect place for practice. It is the last resort where Vajrayana practitioners can practice without obstructions. It is the most suitable place for spiritual realization. And uh, in the Kala Chakra Tantra, Root Tantra, there is a prophecy saying where the king follows the Dharma and his subject rely solely on the Dharma. That place is idle for practice and for living in happiness without conflicts. So this is uh, quoting from the Kala Chakra Root Tantra. The ideal situation uh, uh, described in the pro prophecy is seen by many great masters of Tibetan Buddhist tradition to be similar of Bhutan. So it could be also indicating Bhutan in the prophecy. Because the four abundances, what we in our language call Punsok Teshi, are all present there in this country. The four abundances are um, the teachings of Buddha, that we have the complete package in Bhutan, pursuits, pleasure, and liberation. OK, so my presentation is not just simply I'm uh, expressing my what I think or what I imagine. My statements are all based on a text by uh, Dema Tsermang. Dema Tsermang is one of the 25 disciples of Guru Padmasambhava. And this text was actually um, revealed as a terma, the treasure teachings later, by Ujin Zangpo, another Tertun. So it is about the story, you know, that many of the early speakers keep on telling about the king, Sindaraja from Bumtang, Bhutan. So the text is uh, all about the stories of the King Sindaraja and uh, the coming of Guru Rinpoche to Bhutan. So it is very clear in the text that, you know, the first visit of Guru Padmasambhava, second visit of Guru Padmasambhava, all are very clearly mentioned in the text. So I'm, my source is Dema Chakmang's text, revealed by Ujin Sangbo, the Tirtun, and the text, I was so fortunate that one of, from one of source, I got the copies, you know, just lately. So I prepared according to uh, the text. Okay, so these are uh, the two uh, early um, temples in Bhutan, during which uh, built by King uh, Sonzin Kambo, during which the, the Dharma, the Buddhism was introduced to Tibet. So already in the seventh, uh, seventh century, during Sonsan Kampus time, Buddhism was introduced to Bhutan, and two temples were built, the Jambal Hakang and the Kichul Hakang in Paro. A group of histori uh, historical research experts, including Dr. Uh, Dr. Karma Punso here, um, with the help of uh, uh, different uh, authentic sources, confirmed that 750 AD was the exact year Padmasambhava went to Bhutan for the first time. 762 was his second visit to the to this um, uh, second visit to uh, Bhutan, traveling from Mangyul Kungtang through Yalung Shambo, Lhotrak, and Kembalung, then to Bhutan. So. These details are all found uh, in Dema Chamang's text. One of the main sources, King Sindaraja's biography and uh, prophecies, titled Clear, uh, Clear Mirror, was written by Dema Chamang, uh, late 8th century, um, so born in late 8th century, one of the uh, Padmasambhava's 25 disciples who uh, accompanied Padmasambhava on his journeys and noted down events and the uh, words of his teacher. 
This was discovered as a therma teaching by Tirtun Ujin Sangpo, who was a student of Dorji Lingpa. And his biography, the Dzogchen Sabi Melong, is also mentioned in, the, uh, in his discovery. The text recounts, okay, so uh, this is uh, the current temple, uh, which is um, built on the ruins where King, King Sindaraja's uh, castle, what do you call that, um, Chakar, the palace, uh, used to be located. So the text recounts the story of Sindaraja. King Sindaraja, who was originally a prince of Kapilabastu, because of his misbehavior, he was expelled by his father and then migrated to Bumthang to become his ruler and lived in Chakhar. This is the, the Chakhar, the photo shown in there. The Iron Castle. Sindaraja fought a war with an Indian king, Mawuchi, who was a follower of Padmasambhava during which Sindaraja's son named Takla member was killed. Gorambuchi medi uh, mediated between these two kings. Okay, so this is the pillar erected, uh, erected by, to commemorate the oath, you know, uh, during the peacemaking. So uh, the pillar is still there in Bumta, uh, sorry, uh, Tongsar district erected by Guru Rinpoche, Padmasambhava. For the memory of um, taking oath, taking an oath to keep the peace, Padmasambhava erected a pillar with an inscription. I'm not sure whether the inscription is inscribed on the stone or not, but the inscription is found written in the text, the Matsamang's text. So I would like to cite that also which can be still seen today at, uh, in Tonsa district in a place called Natang, which means at the earth ground. On the north side of the pillar, there is a pillar uh, with the Padmasambhava's handprint. Next, this is Padmasambhava's handprint as a witness. And then on the east, King Sindaraja's, this is King Sindaraja's handprint. On the south, the Dakini, the, the daughter of the king, Sindaraja. Uh, this is her uh, uh, handprint as a witness. And then in the east, King Nawache, the opponent king, his handprint. So I have all the evidences according to these sources. <laughs> Quotation from the Sindaraja's biography and prophecies regarding the pillar. Okay, so this is the inscription. On the kings, uh, all the kings of India and Mon, referring to Bhutan, particularly Bumtang at that time, all the kings of India and Mon with their ministers and subjects. Whatever change time would bring, when you come across this oath pillar, no one should dispute it. This is my loosely rough translation. Whoever would break it, it would be a challenge to me, Padma, referring himself, Padma Sambhava. May all the gods and spirits of the world instantly draw the hard blood and cut the life of those who dispute this oath, pillar. So it is said that Padma Sambhava concealed 30 different types of dermas, treasures, in the area of Nathan, the oath ground, and gave the empowerment of Dubakagi eight Herukas um, to the two kings. So this clearly tells that much before Tibet, uh, the highest form of uh, tantric practice um, and teachings were given to um, the Putinese kings and his followers during Guru Rinpoche's first visit, according to this text. After his visit to Bhutan, Padmasambhava went to Bodh Gaya. So, uh, before he came, uh, uh, during his first visit, before coming to Bhutan, he was in Nepal. Nepal currently, uh, there is one place called Parping. In our language, we call it Yangshu. 
this is the enlightened um, place where Guru Padmasambhava achieved enlightenment. So according to Tantra tradition, that is the Bodhgaya, Tantric Bodhgaya, Tantra tradition, I mean Bodhgaya is in Nepal. After the first visit of Bhutan, then Padmasambhava went to Bodhgaya. So according to text, this is not I'm making any personal statement, and based on my source, Dematsamang's text. So it is very clearly say, told, Padmasambhava went to Bodhgaya from after, after uh, this peacemaking in Bhutan, where he subdued the Tirthikas, following the Vedic traditions, who were controlling the temple, Mahabodhi temple, and renowned, uh, Guru Padmasambhava renovated the Mahabodhi stupa, which was damaged by these Tirthika followers. In the text, he says he will stay in India for 12 years. So it looks like after visiting Bhutan, Guru Padmasambhava spent 12 years in India before going back to uh, Nepal again. And then after spending a month in Nepal, he will go to Tibet. While, was, uh, while he was staying in Nepal, Dakinis gave him a prophecy uh, saying that he should go to Gumtang and there he met the envoys of the Tibetan king but did not uh, follow them together all the way to Tibet. I mean, to meet the Tibetan kings. Okay, so then okay, so this is uh, Dema Chakman. I have two photos in Manghil Kungtang. So the meeting of uh, Dema Chakman and Guru Rinpoche. While Guru Rinpoche was on the way to Tibet, when he reached Manghil Kungtang, he met eight-year-old Dematsyamang, whose father and mother just passed away within the period of one month uh, gap. He was from a powerful family of Tantra, uh, Tantric practitioners, and because of his family had a fierce protector, the villagers were afraid to do the funerary uh, rites for his parents. Guru, Guru Padmasambhava then subjugated the protector, performed the funerary rites, and took the little boy to accompany him for his, uh, uh, on his travels. He was giving him various teachings and in a... I think uh, I'm coming to my most of the important points, so please. <laughs> mm. Okay, so excuse me for this. <laughs> so I really want to give the clear picture so that you, all of you have the information. <laughs> okay, uh, so, but let me do it faster. Mm -hmm. Okay, so he was, uh, then he accompanied uh, Guru Padmasambhava uh, everywhere Guru Padmasambhava went, and Guru, Guru Padmasambhava also taught him. Uh, so within a year, it's like, uh, Dematsaman, the little boy, was able to learn three different, 300 uh, different calligraphic uh, scripts. Guru Rinpoche asked him to travel with him to Bumtang, and they went through Yarlung Shampu, and in Lhotak, they met the king of um, Kembalung, King Kikaratu. The king told Padmasambhava, you came all the way from Tibet. When you were, so this is Guru Rinpoche's second visit to Bhutan. When you were in Bumtang last time, you helped Singaraja, the king, to recover from his illness, left your blessed body, uh, body print, which is still in Bumtang at Guruji, and uh, helped everyone to make peace. Therefore, I would like to invite you to Kembalung, my country. So at Nering, there is a one place called Nering Singhazong, where Guru Padmasambhava did one week long retreat, and all the local spirits were instantly pacified and started be obeying him. In Bumtang, Padmasambhava gave the king uh, the teaching called the clear mirror of uh, great perfection, Melong. The Sindaraja and the king Kikaradu, and the later um, offered uh, his kingdom and all uh, his uh, wealth to Padmasambhava. Dhamat Sakman acted as the treasurer, uh, uh, treasurer and sort of financial um, uh, minister, <laughs> and became one of the most important Padmasambhava's 25 disciples. So this is about uh, Dema Chakman. And then next, I would like to go 
to Tak Chang. Okay. So Jamgun Kong Lot Thai mentions that Padma Sambhava went to Bhutan third time. Uh, I don't know exactly whether Jamgun Kong mentions third time or not, but according to my research, this is uh, what I understand. First visit and the second visit already mentioned, and the third visit was when he actually uh, uh, performed all his miraculous, you know, um, uh, manifestation as a Guru Doji Toli, the most wrathful ones at Tiger Nest. So according to Jamgun Kongtrul, uh, he has mentioned in a context in 108, you know, great Tertun um, uh, biographies, that it is the time when Guru Rinpoche went to Parutaksan is right before he went, he left Tibet from Gumtang. The date of the third visit is not mentioned in the text attributed to Dematsyamang, but from other sources, such as the 100 Tertun uh, biographies by Jamgun Kongtul, it is known that he met, uh, he went to uh, Bhutan from Tibet uh, with Yishit Sojal and was accompanied there by Mumutashi Kyutan, who was uh, uh, from Bhutan. So I have little introduction about Mumutashi Kyutan, Guru Rinpoche's Bhutanese uh, concert, but since we have limited time, so I don't want to uh, read it. Later, I will uh, share my presentations, and then let me go to the next. Okay, so this is Guru uh, Doji Tole, the wrathful form of Guru Padmasambhava. And this painting is drawn. I don't know the, uh, the artist, but it, is, uh, it was done uh, strict, under strict guidance of Jabji Chadar Rinpoche. And uh, I got it from Dujum Yangtze Rinpoche from Tibet. And it is a blessing for all of you. Please have a look at it. When uh, Padma Sambhava manifested as Dorji Tolu at Paro, Tashi Kyutun manifested as female tigress. His vehicles, the Padma Sambhava, uh, subjugated most of the terrifying demonic forces known as Damsi demons, Samaya transgressors. Chojam Tumba Rinpoche gives a very interesting description about it. So this is something um, that I want to quote Tumba Rinpoche, uh, describing the manifestation of Guru, Do Guru Rinpoche as this form, in this form. Tumba Rinpoche says, he was half Indian and half Tibetan, an Indian looking uh, a person dressed up like a Tibetan madman. <laughs> he held a vajra and a dagger, flame shot from his body, and he rode a pregnant tigers. It was quite strange. He was not quite a local deity, and nor quite a conventional guru. He was neither warrior nor king. He was certainly not an ordinary person. Riding on a tiger is regarded as a mistake, but he somehow managed to do it. Was he trying to disguise himself as a Tibetan, or what uh, was he trying to do? He was not particularly teaching anything. You couldn't deal with him as a born priest or a missionary. He wasn't converting anybody. That didn't seem to be his style either. He was just instigating chaos all over the place. Even the local deities were confused, utterly upset. The symbol of the tiger is also interesting. A pregnant tigress is supposed to be the most vicious of all tigers. She is hungry, slightly crazy, and completely illogical. You cannot read her psychology and work with it reasonably. She is quite likely to eat you up any time. And that is the nature of Doji Tolu's transport vehicle. This tiger could be said to represent crazy skillfulness and Doji Tolu as crazy wisdom that rides on it. They make an excellent couple. So this is quoting from Trungpa Rinpoche describing Guru Rinpoche's manifestation at Taksang. Yes. And this is not photoshopped. The, the mountain naturally shapes like a wrathful face, a lion face. And it is a speci uh, special place. Many seeing um, uh, this rock formation as a, a manifestation of Doji Tolu. Many great masters, including Tigui Kinsi Rinpoche, Kyapche Dujum Rinpoche, Kempo Jigme Punso, and uh, they all went to extend, extended, uh, to do extended retreats at Paro Taksang and reveal many Dharma uh, teachings there. Coming of Guru Padma Sambhava was the most significant turning point for both Tibet and Bhutan. He was indeed the most important father figure for, Putin, uh, for Buddhist civilization in these countries. We could never fully put into words Padma Sampawa's great act of kindness. 
Unfortunately, many seem to disregard Padma Sambhava's tremendous kindness by negating his legacy that shaped these uh, countries throughout history. Many in the past employed repressive measures against these followers, forcibly converting monasteries and destroying religious artifacts associated to Padma Sambhava. So this is the main point that I wanted to raise. His numerous instructions, guidance, and prophecies regarding the future of Tibet and Bhutan and how to safeguard these countries and preserve Dharma and had great impact on their history. I think it is important to raise the issue and discuss how, in spite of Padma Sampawa's immeasurable kindness and generosity, his teachings were often attacked during history, even today. I don't mean to get into any sectarian controversy or offend anyone, but I would like to show a few examples. OK, so in Urgyan Mingpa's short version of Katang, it says that, although I have shown the great kindness of Tibet, beings remain persistently ungrateful. Yet, through the power of continuous prayers to me, I will avert all negativity, even in the worst times. Rinpoche notes in his books called, uh, book called the, uh, the Reign of Adam and uh, Fire that Pawan Khabar Dechinyingpo, a great scholar from Gilup tradition, once sent a group of his monks to Shang Kumtang Ritu Hakan, a temple in Tibet near Tashilhumpu, a temple that ho uh, housed a Padma Sampawa statue as, it, uh, as its main image and ordered them to destroy the statue and throw it into river. Rajin Rinpoche, who was the regent at that time, took the matter to court. The Reign of Adam, uh, Adam, uh, Admin Fire, the book by Chatter Rinpoche, published by Sapin Institute, Delhi 2005, page 68. I'm quoting it. One of the two letters on the screen written in Tibetan that you see is by Pabun Khawa, the great um, Gelugpa uh, scholar, to a Chinese army general of Kuomintang government, Liu Wenhui, who was the chairman of Sichuan province, and later he, the administrative leader of Xichang province, which is referring to Tibet, for 10 years. Pabun Khawa's letter are introduced in his collected works in volume Cha. He wrote three uh, deceitful letters to this general trying to get his m m military support by condemning the other schools, especially in Nyingma traditions. So in his letter that I have translated into English roughly, states that all, so this is the letter, all other Buddhist traditions in Tibet think and claim that their view is Nagarjuna's Prasangika Madhemika. However, as the Prasangika Madhemika view is extremely profound and subtle, the followers of these traditions are not able to fathom the ultimate view of these uh, great past scholars and accomplished masters. Hence, their view is incorrect. Most of their views tend to be that of Hashang Mahayana, and thus accumulate the cause to fall into nihilistic view, resulting to be born in the hell realms. In the second letter to, uh, to one of his Chinese our followers, Chinese monk. He also wrote to his Chinese disciple, his name is Upasaka New Salmutang, uh, telling him to spread even all these uh, sectarian messages to his other Chinese followers. So the letter states, these days, the views of Sakya, Kachu, Nyingma, and others are mistaken. Let alone their view being Prasangika Madhamika, they don't have the view, even that of the Sautantrika Madhamika. They also uh, solely meditate upon the nihilistic view of the uh, likes of the Tirthikas and the Hashang Mahayana. Holding the nihilistic view will undoubtedly lead to the hell of ultimate torment. Hence, they don't have the unmistaken path to liberation and supreme enlightenment. Even, in, uh, even it one, if one meditates upon such a view, 1, year, for 1,000 years, one will never achieve any realization. This, is, this doesn't serve any purpose 
as it is like aspiring for butter by churning water. Finally, I request you to translate these words into Chinese and pronounce it to others, Chinese upasakas, the lay practitioners. This is what uh, he wrote in his second letter. Now the summary, the uh, conclusion. When you look at the um, internet, the major sites, you look up to learn about the history of Bhutan, or guidebooks, or even if you go there and listen to your local tourist guides. Bhutanese history and tradition seems to start only in 17th century with Shabdung Mawanyamge. While before him, there was famous Nyingma masters like living there, like Longchen Rabjampa, Dorji Lingpa, Pema Lingpa, just to name the most few ones. In 2016, the Prime Minister of Bhutan, Sirin Tobje in Paro said in a conference, owing to Guru Padmasambhava's powerful blessings and prophecy, Shabtun Nguyen Namjal founded our nation. The unification of our nation was in accordance with the prophecy of Guru Padmasambhava. Later, the emergence of Gongsa Ujil Nongchu as the first king of Bhutan was also introduced, uh, sorry, uh, was also uh, in accordance with the prophecy of Guru Padmasambhava to fulfill the need of time. In Ujil Nongchu's short version of Gatang, there is a prophecy by Padmasambhava about the kings of Bhutan, written as written in Tibet, Ch uh, Tibetan language, Chukit, Buntang Chone Ti Sujanan, Kyazi Chutim Jongi Naduchan. In Buntang, there will be defeat all, uh, in all sectors of the kindness. Uh, this is not my translation. Then an emanation of myself will return to protect the Dharma right across the empire. Shatu Nongyal amazingly kind, great master, has undisputable role in unifying Bhutan and fighting back the Tibetan Mongol army uh, at three consecutive times. If he has not able to succeed, the defend, uh, succeed to defend the country, Bhutan would have not been able to keep its sovereignty. He also had a great role in preserving the legacy of Padmasambhava and the treasures of the Nyingma schools in spiritual uh, material sense. Shabdun invited uh, Narchan Rigzin Longbu from Kongpo and received transmission of, uh, transmissions and initiations of Tirdun Sangye Lingpa's Lama Gongdu at Paru Taksan. The annual Drupchen ceremonies of Lama Gongda Duba and Radna Lingpa's Pajrakilaya Sadhana uh, practices are carried out in a very extensive way uh, in every zone in Bhutan. Festivals like the Guru Tsenge, a manifestation of Guru Padmasambhava, and other religious events are state-sponsored rit uh, rituals in Bhutan, which show the great faith Bhutanese people have in Guru Padmasambhava even today. Following the prophecies of Guru Padmasambhava, Jamgun Kongtu Lodu Thai and Jamin Kinse Wangpo advise Gongsa Ukin Wangchu, the first king of Bhutan, full, uh, who fulfilled by building, uh, fulfilled the prophecy by building the Sambal Hindu Hagan at Gurje Buntang uh, with the towering Guru Rinpoche statue inside facing east directions in um, 1900. Regarding this, I heard from some of my precious lamas that Kyabji Dujum Rinpoche Jigdali Yishi Doji Singh. It is solely due to the blessings of Guru Rinpoche and collective uh, merits of Bhutanese people. The noble king of Bhutan fulfilled one of the infallible prophecies of Guru Padmasambhava um, just on time as the situations demanded. Because of this landmark initiative taken by the noble king, people and nation of Bhutan enjoys peace and happiness, prosperity without decline today. Thus, I ask in the beginning, how is it possible that a small country like a Bhutan has never been colonized and how can that it became the last standing Vajrayana Buddhist kingdom and is regarded to be the happiest country in the world? It is possible because of Guru Padmasambhava's blessings. And in, other, um, in order to preserve his legacy, it is important to give a full picture of Bhutanese history. So that's all about my presentation concludes with this photo of his, uh, his eminence, sorry, His Majesty the King, bowing at Guru Mbache. So thank you very much. That's all, I think. So thank you very much. I'm Kadoji Rinpoche Ji. I'm sorry of the time constraint which made me come up to you, but uh, these, all these conferences are designed for 
short presentations, and if one really wants to get into the topic, it's always difficult. So I understand your uh, problem. But thank you for the lovely visuals and all the information that you gave. And um, of course, Pavonka Rinpoche is one of my guru's uh, gurus, so, well, but that's okay. I mean, we, we live with contradiction. It's, uh, it's all, uh, I think there's some wonderful quote by Guru Rinpoche saying just samsara is uh, unfortunate or impure dependent arising. So what to do, you know? We, we do our best <coughs> in this situation. Now, uh, I think uh, tea has got cold, so let's forget tea, even though we are from Indian and British paramparas. Um, or we'll have it a bit later. But I would request our next uh, venerable speaker, Kempo Pema uh, Tuptenla, uh, to perhaps keep it, yeah, not too, is Rinpoche gonna, is, you'll speak in Tibetan, is it? And someone will translate? No. no. In oh. Hindi. Okay, in Hindi we will say it. It's very good, So I think, those who don't speak Hindi, just uh, space out and enjoy. <laughs> we'll go and have tea. Um, <clears throat> wonderful. So, Kempo Ji, you are from Nako Gaon, which is where are you? Kinor. 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 So, he completed his middle school education, entered Palpo Mishara Bling, that's Thay Sri Trimbache's monastery, uh, took um, ordination from uh, Thay Sri Trimbache Ji, and then uh, uh, took his education. Anyway, you can read all this. It's very big, which you have written about. So you will not take your time. You will give it to your time. Thank you so much. So, Kempo Pemala, please, uh, hum ko, uh, prakashit ki jay. Namo, namo, buddhaye, namo. Guru Padam Sambhav ke आशीर्वाद से भरपूर आज का ये सम्मेलन संगोष्ठी मंच पर विराजमान अध्यक्ष कबीर सक्सेना जी तथा गुरु पदम संभव के निधि ग्रंथ के आविष्कारक रिम्बोचेगण विद्वानगण तथा श्रोताओं सर्वप्रथम आप सभी को मेरा तय दिल से नमस्कार <coughs> अब मैं आप लोगों के समक्ष गुरु पदम समब जी के जीवनी तथा उनके प्रवचनों का सार के बारे में थोड़ा बहुत शब्द प्रस्तुत करूंगा आशा है कि आप लोग पसंद जरूर करेंगे जब अर्थ संयक संबुद्ध के पचहयान का शासन बहुत ही प्रचलित हो रहे थे तो ठीक उसी समय आठवीं शताब्दी के भारतीय बौद्ध गुरु गुरु पदम संभव ने मगत का राजा देवपाल तथा ओडियन का राजा हयालीला के समय जन्म ली जन्म लेते समय एक महान पुरुष होने की असंख्य शुभ चिन्हों से सुशोभित बालक को देख लोग हैरान हो गए उनके जन्म को लेकर अनेक ऋषि मुनियों ने विभिन्न प्रकार के भविष्यवाणी की पर सबका यह मानना एक था कि यह भाग्यवान बालक भविष्य में प्रतिभाशाली होनहार तथा अतुलनीय महान पुरुष बनेंगे एक दिन जब एक महायोगी वहां पधारे तो उनसे पूछने पर कहा कि यह बालक तंत्रयान के एक महासिद्ध बनेंगे इसलिए उनका नाम पदम बासी रखने को कहा जिन्हें आज आचार्य गुरु पदम संभव के नाम से जाने जाते हैं हालांकि उनके जन्म के संबंध में अलग अलग व्याख्याएं हैं कुछ इतिहासकार इस बात की पुष्टि करते हैं कि उनका जन्म ओडियन राजा के राजकुमार के रूप में तथा कुछ का दावा है कि वन वर्ष के छठे महीने के दसवें दिन दानकोश जेल में ओडियन राजा इंद्र बोधी के समय एक सुंदर कमल फूल के बीच आठ साल के एक बालक के रूप में प्रकट हुए बड़े होने पर अपने गुरुओं से पंच महाविद्या की शिक्षा संपूर्ण कर शरण शरणागत के एक मठ में एक विनय दर से शरणागत एवं उपासक की दीक्षा तथा अभिधर्म एवं सूत्रों के बारे में बहुत सारी शिक्षाएं ग्रहण की योगी शांति रूप से तंत्रयान के चार प्रकार के तंत्रों में से 
पहला तीन का अभिषेक तथा महासिद सुखदेव एवं सुख दादी सर्वशत वजह दर्श से अनगिनत गंभीर उपदेशों को हासिल कर एकांत उद्धम पर जाकर साधना करने लगे तो सर्वपर में नाना प्रकार के अशुभ लक्षण दिखाई देने लगे फिर वे हौसला बढ़ाकर निरंतर व्यस्त रहे अंत में सोबर में विशिष्ट रूप से बुद्ध अमिताभ तथा अन्य बुद्ध एवं बौद्ध स्तंभ लोग तथा साक्षात रूप में क्रोधराज हरिवा का दर्शन एवं ढेर सारे अमृत उपदेश भी मिले जब राजा हरिमीला का पुत्र राजकुमार अक्ष लीला राज संभाल कर कुछ ही समय बीते तो वे राजमहल पर प्राय जाने लगे और ज्योतिष के कामकाज के साथ अपने अमृत वाणी के सारे राजा अक्ष लीला को धर्मराज बनाने के प्रयत्न करने लगे एक उपवन में एक मठ निर्माण कर लगभग हजारों विषयों के साथ रहने लगे तभी उनके सेवकों में से एक योग्य राजा का सचिव तथा दो मंत्री तीनों मिलकर जब राज्य को अपने अधिकार में करना चाहा तत्पश्चात वे लोग राजमहल जाकर राजा से कहा कि पदमवासी आपका राज्य को हटपना चाहता है उनका मठ बनाना मठ के चारों ओर दीवारें तथा हजारों विषयों को अपने शिष्य के रूप में स्वीकारना ये सब मतलब आपसे युद्ध करने हैं तो उनका एक चाल है यह सुनकर राजा बहुत क्रोध हुए तुरंत अपने मंत्री एवं सैनिकों को जाकर पदमवासी एवं हजारों विषयों को वहां से बगाने के आदेश दिए राजा के आदेश का पालन कर जब वे शिष्य के संग सब कुछ छोड़कर वहां से जाने लगे तो उन्होंने ये सोचा कि अगर हम इन्हें मृत्यु दंड नहीं दें तो ये भविष्य में फिर से हम पर नुकसान पहुंचाएगी ये सोच रस्सी तथा हुए की जंजीरों से बांध हथियारों से उन पर हमला करने लगे तो अपने विद्या मंत्र के सारे उन्होंने सब कुछ तो, तोड़कर टुकड़े टुकड़े कर दिए फिर से उन्हें पकड़कर आग में जलाने की तथा जमीन पर दफनाने की कोशिश की पर सभी कोशिशें नाकामयाब रहे अंत में जब नदी में फेंके तो एक चिड़िया की रूप धारण कर आकाश में उड़ चली उसके बाद विभिन्न पवित्र कब्रिस्तानों में जाकर कड़ी तपस्या करने लगे नगर छोड़ तक पश्चात मंत्री तथा सैनिक जिन्होंने उन पर हुआ कि वे सभी के किसी के घर पर आग लगने से तथा किसी ने आत्महत्या कर एक के बाद एक सभी की मृत्यु हो गई अंत में राजा भी सांप के शिकार होने के कारण देहांत हो गए पवित्र कब्रिस्तानों में साधना के वक्त महाकाल एवं यमन तक आदि क्रोधी देव देवताओं ने साक्षात उनके समुख प्रकट होकर अमृत उपदेशों से उनके दृढ़ संकल्प को पूर्ण की शक्तिशाली असुरों के साथ अनाधिकाल से स्थापित सुप्रसिद्ध आठ शमशानों में पराया रिद्धि के बल जाकर काजल गुल का पुत्र गति इत्यादि आठ साधारण महासिद्ध को प्राप्त की जब बोधि प्राप्त करना यानी कि बुद्ध बनने की इच्छा प्रकट की तो सौदन ने अमिताभ बुद्ध ने कहा कि जब तक परमात्मा शून्य तक का साक्षात्कार एवं अभिज्ञान की अलग दृष्टि को पाए बिना मात्र उग्र गतिविधियों से बोधि को प्राप्त नामुमकिन है इसलिए उन्हें शिखर बुद्ध ज्ञान श्री के पास जाकर उनके उपदेशों का साधना करने की भविष्यवाणी दी झारने पर सोचने लगा कि मुझे सामान्य आठ वर्धन तथा मंत्रों का सिद्धि तो प्राप्त हो चुकी है पर वे नहीं ऐसा सोच तत्पश्चात उत्तम सिद्धि की प्राप्ति के लिए बिहार के मगध नगर की ओर प्रस्थान हुए मगध का राजा धर्मपाल के शासन के समय मगध पहुंचे तो आचार्य बुद्ध ज्ञान श्री ने सर्वप्रथम उन्हें उपसंपदा प्रतिमोक्ष संवर्ग प्रदान की वहां के एक विनय दस से विनय के बारे में प्रवचन सुने तो एक ही बार में सब कुछ सीख पड़ी आचार्य ज्ञान श्री से प्रज्ञा पारमिता का श्रवण मनन तथा साधना की तो प्रज्ञा पारमिता का साक्षात्कार हुआ निरंतर तंत्रयान के किय तंत्र चर्य तंत्र योग तंत्र तथा अनुतर तंत्र इन चार तंत्रों में से विशेषकर अनुतर तंत्र का अभ्यास करने पर स्वाभाविक ज्ञान पहले के अपेक्षा काफी सुदृढ़ हुई उसके बाद 
आगे क्या करने को पूछने पर बुद्ध ज्ञान श्री ने बंगाल पारी नगर के उत्तर दिशा के पर्वत पर जाकर हिरुगा की कड़ी तपस्या करने के आदेश दिए आदेश अनुसार वो वहां पहुंचे और छह महीने तक आचार्य के वचन का पालन कर कड़ी तपस्या की साधना के वक्त बहुत सारे बुद्धों ने साक्षात उनके सम्मुख बधा कर उन्हें गंभीर उपदेश प्रदान की इस तरह अंत में उत्तम सिद्धि बुद्धव को प्राप्त यानी कि वे सम्यक संबुद्ध बन गए तत्पश्चात बुद्धचित की उत्पन्नता के समय प्राणियों के हित की मंशा को संपूर्ण करने हेतु त्रिहुतला कमरु त्रिमल तिलिंग औदंतपुरी राजगिरु नालंदा तथा विक्रमशील आदि भारत तिब्बत भूटान तथा नेपाल आदि देश के चारों दिशाओं में जाकर अपने तांत्रिक उपाय तथा अमृतवाणी के सहारे लोगों को सत्य के मार्ग दिखाए जब हिमाचल मंडी के राजकुमारी मंडल गुप्त में जाकर उनसे तांत्रिक शिक्षा लेने लगे तो राजा को पता चलने पर उन्होंने जिंदा जलाने की कोशिश की सात दिन तक आग निरंतर जलता रहा सात दिन बाद जब राजा देखने गए तो गुरु पदम संभव को एक झील में कमल के फूल पर विराजमान देख राजा उससे बहुत प्रभावित हुए और तुरंत अपने मुकुट तथा राजकुमारी मंडप दोनों उनको बैंड कर दी वह झील आज हिमाचल मंडी जिले में रिवासी झील के नाम से प्रसिद्ध है उनका सतवाथ विशेषकर हिमालय के क्षेत्रों में उनका अधिक प्रभाव पड़ा इसलिए संपूर्ण तिब्बत वासी और हिमालय क्षेत्र के लोग आज भी आचार्य गुरु पदम संभव को गुरु रंभुक्षी के नाम से जाने जाते हैं जिन्होंने तांत्रिक उपाय से जहां पानी की कमी थी वहां पानी और जहां पानी का नुकसान था वहां पानी कम करना आदि बहुत सारे आश्चर्यजनक कर्मों द्वारा लोगों की भलाई की नेपाल भूटान तथा भारत के हिमालय क्षेत्रों में आज भी गुरु पदम संभव के जितने भी पवित्र स्थल है वहां छोटे बड़े पानी का झरना अवश्य देखने को मिलते हैं वो देश तिब्बत में अन्य देशों से भी बढ़कर उनका सतवार्थ रहा जैसे कि सम्राटन के शासनकाल में जब आर्य भारत नालंदा महाविहार के महान दार्शनिक उपाध्याय शांतरक्षित को तिब्बत आमंत्रित कर अनुवादक कश्मीरी के सारे दस कुशल क्रम पतपात के बारह अंग तथा अठारह धातु आदि धर्मों का शिक्षा तथा समय महाविहार का निर्माण कर रहे थे तो वहां के स्थानीय सांसारिक नाग तथा सुर असरों में क्रोध होकर लोगों में बीमारी बारी वर्षा आंधी तूफान महल में बिजली तथा ओले आदि गिराने से अशुभ घटनाएं कटी धर्म के विरोधी दलों ने इन सब का दोष उपाध्याय तक ठहराया जिससे लोगों में बहुत हरकन मच गई जिसे शांत करने के लिए पांच मंत्रियों के साथ राजा उपाध्याय शांत रक्षित के पास जाकर नमन की और बहुत सारे सवर्ण बैठ कर जब तक धर्म के विरोधी दल तथा लोग शांत ना हो जाए तब तक के लिए नेपाल चले जाने का तथा शांत होने पर फिर से पधारने की प्रार्थना की राजा के वचन को स्वीकार कर कहा कि यहाँ के देवी देवता सुर असुर क्रोध हो चुके हैं जिससे सदन के प्रचार प्रसार पर बाधा आ रही है इसे शांत करने के लिए भारतीय प्रसिद्ध तांत्रिक गुरु पदम संभव को यहाँ आमंत्रित करना होगा उपाध्याय के नेपाल चले जाने के बाद जब वहां की परिस्थिति सामान्य हुआ तो उपाध्याय एवं गुरु पदम संभव को तिब्बत आमंत्रण के लिए पांच सहयोगी के संग मंत्री सम्मान तथा सिंधुलाल नामक दो आमंत्रक भेजे दोनों के सम्मुख पहुंचने पर दोनों को तिब्बत पदाने की विनती की तत्पश्चात शांत रक्षित जल्द ही तिब्बत पहुंच गए और गुरु पदम संभव तथा सम्य महाविहार के निर्माण के लिए एक महान कार्य तथा आमंत्रक जो कि बाद में निकले रास्ते में तिब्बत के किडोन नामक स्थान से लेकर राजा के सम्मुख न पहुंचने तक बीच में सुर तथा असुरों का उन पर बाधा आता रहा पर उन पर कोई प्रभाव नहीं पड़ा गुरु पदम सब में बाधा पहुंचाने वाले सभी सुर तथा असुरों को शांत कर अपने सहयोगियों के संग नामक विहार में कुशलता पूर्वक पहुंचे 
जहां सम्राट शिशुओं देशों ने उनका हार्दिक स्वागत कर सदन के प्रचार प्रसार हेतु अपने उद्देश्यों को उनके सम्मुख प्रस्तुत किए लगभग छह महीने से भी अधिक विभिन्न महलों तथा विहारों में जाकर राजा तथा लोगों की रुचि एवं समर्थ्य के अनुसार प्रवचन प्रतिष्ठापन तथा धर्म के प्रति बाधा पहुंचाने वाले संसारी सुर असुर तथा नाग आदि को बुद्ध की शासन की रक्षा के बाद से प्रतिबंधित कर सम्राट तथा उपाध्याय दिनों ने मिलकर संजय महाविहार के निर्माण का कार्य प्रारंभ किया जो लगभग तेरह वर्ष में बनकर तैयार हुआ जिसका रूप भारत के औदमपुरी बिहार का ही दूसरा रूप था जो वास्तव में बौद्ध धर्म के एक सुदृढ़ आधारशिला बनी कुछ समय बीतने पर गुरु पदम सबब के प्रतिहारे अभिज्ञा एवं शक्ति से नाखुश होकर कुछ दुष्ट मंत्रियों ने मिलकर उन्हें तिब्बत से बगाना चाहा, तो राजा से कहा कि अगर आप इस तंत्र को यहां से न निकाला जाए तो एक दिन यह आपका राज्य छीन देगा और यहाँ के सारे अमूल्य वस्तुएं भारत ले जाएंगे ऐसा बार बार कहने पर अंत में राजा ने उन्हें बहुत सारी सोना भेंट की और नमन कर तिब्बत से वापस चले जाने की प्रार्थना की गुरु पदम संभव ने कहा मेरा तिब्बत आना इस सोने के प्रति नहीं बल्कि यहाँ सदैन के प्रचार प्रसार पर आ रही बाधाओं को नष्ट कर तिब्बत को एक सुख समृद्धि एवं शांतिपूर्ण देश बनाने के लिए आया हूं अन्यथा सोने की जरूरत होती तो कहकर आसपास के पत्थरों को छूते ही शुद्ध सोने में बदल दिए राजा के प्राथमिक अनुसार वापस जाने से पहले आने वाले सदी के प्राणियों के हित के लिए बहुत सारे पोथियों को रिद्ध के पल जाकर चट्टानों में सागरों में तथा आसमान पे निधि के रूप में छिपाया जिसे आज उन पोथियों को निधि लिपे एवं निधि ग्रंथ भी कहते हैं भविष्य में अनगिनत निधि आविष्कारों कागो द्वारा निधि ग्रंथों को निकालकर सदन के प्रचार प्रसार चारों दिशाओं में फैलने की भविष्यवाणी भी की वास्तव में वे सभी आविष्कारक उन्हीं का ही रूप का था उन आविष्कारों में से एक मंच पर साक्षात विराजमान परम पूज्य साधना मिंजू रंगे जी का प्रथम अवतार रिंजन मिजुर दोजे जिन्होंने गुरु पदम संभव द्वारा छिपाए गए बहुत सारे निधि ग्रंथ अपने अभिज्ञा एवं रिद्धि के बल जाकर निकाला जिनमें से तीन ग्रंथ बहुत ही प्रसिद्ध हैं, जिन्हें बोटी भाषा में योगे पुरुषुम के नाम से जाने जाते हैं <coughs> वर्तमान सातवा मिंगी रंग कर्मजुर्म तेनजिन इन्होंने भी बहुत ही कम उम्र में शरदलिंग मठ में परम पूजे बारहवें ताइस जी से तथा नेपाल में अपने सौभाग्य पिता श्री पूज्य टुगो ओगेन मोचे आदि महान गुरुओं से तीन यानों से संबंधित शिक्षा संपूर्ण की इनके द्वारा रचित पुस्तकों में से जॉय ऑफ लिविंग पुस्तक जो आज देश विदेशों में बहुत ही प्रसिद्ध है बचपन से इस मोचे को साधना ध्यान में बैठने का बहुत ही शौक था उसे भी वहां से गुरुओं से सीख अपने मंशा को पूरा की परिणाम स्वरूप देश विदेश में आज इनका नाम इक्कीसवी सदी के महायोगी के नाम से जाने जाते हैं भविष्यवाणी के बाद अंत में गुरु पदम संभव तथा दो मंत्री जो उनके प्रति अटूट श्रद्धा थी उनके संग घुड़सवार होकर तिब्बत से वापस चल पड़े आधा रास्ता तय करने पर गुरु पदम संभव ने रुककर दोनों से कहा अगर सांसारिक नाग तथा सुर असुरों को तीन बार सदन की रक्षा के बाद से प्रतिबंधित तथा देश के सुख समृद्धि के लिए वह विशाल हवन का पूजन किया होता तो सम्राट की त्रिगायु तथा बोट यानी कि तिब्बत एक सुख समृद्धि एवं शांतिपूर्ण देश बनना था पर मैं इसे संपूर्ण नहीं कर सका कहकर चिंतित सा रूप दिखाकर अब मुझे दक्षिण पश्चिम के द्वीप के राष्ट्रकों की दमन के लिए जाना है कहकर गोरे से आसमान में उड़ चले दोनों ने बादलों के बीच गुरु पदम संभव को लुप्त हो जाने तक देखा फिर वापस लौट कर सम्राट को सारी बातें बताई सुनकर राजा बहुत चिंतित होने लगे दक्षिण पश्चिमी द्वीप के राष्ट्रों के दमन से पहले गुरु पदम संभव ने दो दिन यानी कि दमी दो द्वीप पहुंच कर वहां के राष्ट्रों को प्रतिबंधित की तथा वहां के राजा से लेकर समस्त लोगों को प्रतिहार्य अभिज्ञा शक्ति तथा मधुरवाणी से आकर्षित किए और 
विद्या अर्धा तथा शुद्ध नामक तीन विहार का निर्माण कर मगध से तीन उपाध्यायों को भी बुलाया जिन्होंने लोगों को तिलपेटक से संबंधित शिक्षा दी गुरु पदम संभव में जब छह भाग्यवान शिष्यों को छह प्रकार के तंत्रों के उपदेश प्रदान की तो साधना करने पर वे सभी महासिद्ध बन गए कहते हैं कि उन्होंने अलग अलग स्थानों पर एक ही समय में पांच विहार का निर्माण भी किया इस तरह गुरु पदम संभव मानवे स्थल के सत्वार्थ संपन्न कर अमानवे राष्ट्रों के सत्वार्थ हेतु तो आकाश में पंच की तरह उठकर प्रस्थान हुए जहां पहुंचकर अमानवे राष्ट्रों ने धर्म के वचनों से राग देश एवं मोह इन सांसारिक जड़ों से मुक्ति दिलाकर परम सत्वार्थ रहा वैसे तो गुरु पदम संभव के प्रवचन धर्मोपदेशों का कोई संख्या नहीं है लेकिन समय अनुसार उनके प्रवचनों का सार जिसे तिब्बत के कजु संप्रदाय के लोग महामुद्रा तथा इमा संप्रदाय के लोग महासंपन्न कहते हैं तो मैं इसके बारे में संक्षिप्त में थोड़ा सा शब्द प्रस्तुत करूंगा महासंपन्न का सरल अर्थ है संपूर्ण लौकिक एवं लोकोत्तर धर्मों से संपन्न आवास एवं शून्य का युगन जिन्हें तथागत गर्भ भी कहते हैं ये तथागत गर्भ उच्च नीच सभी प्राणियों के मन में स्थित है यही मन का वास्तविक रूप है जिसे मैं पहचान कर सभी प्राणी अनादि काल से राग देश और मो आदि कलेशों के वंश में जाकर इस संसारी कारागर में फंस कर भिन्न भिन्न दुखों को झेल रहे हैं बुद्ध शाके में भी कहते हैं सभी जीव जंतु स्वयं बुद्ध है सभी का आर्थिक स्वभाव बुद्ध है पर सभी को पहचानने में कमी रह गई है इसलिए वो कहते हैं स्वयं को पहचानो इसे पहचानने की विधि भी असंख्य है पर सबसे सरल उपाय ध्यान अवस्था में बैठकर मन को एकाग्रित कर अकृतम स्वभाव यानी कि बिन सोच बिन बनावटी में बैठकर साधना करना जिससे मन की आर्थिक शक्ति एवं ज्ञान साक्षात होने लगते हैं स्वयं भगवान होना या शांत एकाग्रचित से मन की शक्ति बनने के एक उदाहरण जैसे कभी हम पाप के कर्मों से बचकर मन को अपने वंश कर सदैव दूसरों के हित की काम करने लग जाते हैं तो लोगों की नजर में भी हमें उन्हें भगवान की तरह दिखने लगते हैं और वे मुंह से भी कह लेते हैं कि अरे आप तो साक्षात भगवान ही हो तो मैं समझता हूं कि उनका कहना गलत नहीं है क्योंकि मन को अपने वंश कर शांत रहने वाला व्यक्ति वो प्राणी का वास्तविक रूप बुद्ध यानी कि भगवान के समीप होते हैं दूसरा जैसे कभी हम अपने ऐनक को अपने ही माथे पर रखकर थक न जाने तक उसे ढूंढने लग जाते हैं और थक कर जब मन सोच विचारों से दूर होकर थोड़ा सा शांत होने लगते हैं तभी मन की शक्ति बनने से ऐनक अपने माथे पर ही पाया जाता है ठीक उसी तरह निरंतर मन को शांत अकृतम स्वभाव में रखने से मन की शक्ति एवं ज्ञान की वृद्धि होने लगती है महासंपन्न की साक्षात्कार के लिए परंपरागत गुरु के आशीर्वाद सर्वश्रेष्ठ माना गया जिसे पाने के लिए मूल गुरु के प्रति अटूट श्रद्धा वालू भक्ति भाव की जरूरत होती है इस तरह पुण्य एवं ज्ञान संभाग को संचय करने पर सम्यक संबुद्ध की प्राप्त हो जाती है सौमंगलम जय बुद्धा जय दर्मा जय संग बहुत बहुत धन्यवाद हेम्पो प्रेमत उपतिनला शर्म की बात है कि मैं इतना नहीं समझ सका जो मैं अंग्रेजी में समझता हूँ वो मेरा कमी है आधुनिकता का प्रभाव है जो इस देश को खा चुका है लेकिन बहुत बहुत धन्यवाद कि आप एक किन्नौर के आदमी हम लोग राजधानी में आके हिंदी में बोल रहे हैं ये बहुत बढ़िया बात है और आपने काफ़ी रिसर्च किया काफ़ी कुछ बताया उसके लिए बहुत बहुत धन्यवाद ना आई एम नॉट शो वेदर वे हैविंग टी और वॉट बिकॉज आई एम नॉट द मेन ऑर्गेनाइजर कैन अ मेन ऑर्गेनाइजर इन लाइटनेस वॉट्स हैपनिंग वेर एन आर लेट आई एम सॉरी tea drinker <laughs> <laughs> and i think we need a little break for tea so what we're going to do is though we have kind of crossed 
an hour into the next session. Uh, but it was a very enlightening session, so I think thank you very much for all of us. Uh, so we'll take a break, but a very short break. We should be back in about 15 minutes so that we can get into the next session as soon as possible. So the tea awaits you outside. Uh, have a quick tea break, bio break, uh, and a break. 15 minutes, we'll be back. And thank you so much, uh, all of you. Thank you, thank you.